All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. We got, uh, there was a, uh, I went to a meeting in Lanier County one time. Lanier County, if you don't know, down there by Eccles County, south of here. And as much as I couldn't believe it, one grower showed up. One grower. And actually, as it turns out, that grower was there, was in a restaurant by the hospital, and he just happened to be eating there, and the county agent grabbed him because nobody showed up. All right, so he got to came up. I thought, well, this is good. This is good. Because obviously, this grower wants to know. He's here, and I'm going to give him the best I can, and I'm going to go on. So I went on, I gave him, I gave him a good, what I thought was what that grower needed to learn. And afterwards, he kind of quiet, and he thanked me, he appreciated it. And he said, you know, you ever hear about that, uh, about the uh, man showed up at church one day, and he was the only one in the church service. And the preacher went, and he gave him, he gave him the whole sermon, getting older than he needed it. He said, you know, I'm, I'm a farmer. He said, you know, if we, uh, we have a herd of cows, and we, uh, we load the wagon up, we give them all the hay and all the feed they need, if we go out there, you know, if we get there and only one cow shows up, we don't unload the whole, <laughs> the whole feed and hay with it. So basically what it says to me is we didn't need to hear all of it. But, uh, I didn't tell that real well, but the point was, he may not have wanted all the good information I gave him. But I'm going to give it to you, and uh, you can ask me questions as we go along and stop when we're, when we're done. I'm Bob Kimwright, uh, Extension Specialist at the University of Georgia. Steve Brown, I've just been told I have a 9.5% teaching assignment now. Point. I said, I don't want it. They said, you got it. And I said, I don't want it. But anyway, um, I cover corn, cotton, soybeans, and peanuts. And uh, very happy to work with you all. My office number, if anybody wants it, I can give you uh, an email address if you want. Come on in the house. Um, most of you all can pass. These handouts out, if you want them, if you don't, if you want to take them. But what I'm going to talk about today is diseases and nematode management in cotton. And I was asked earlier on, before the first talk even started, I said, what have you possibly got to tell us that's new this year that we haven't heard a hundred times? What's new this year? Okay. We're going to talk about some nematicides, specifically vellum total, which we hope will be available. Steve, you always know where to find me if you need one of those handouts. Right? If you don't got a handout, I apologize. Um, we'll talk about some new fungicides that are out there. We'll talk about some new nematicides out there. We'll talk about varieties. And there are some new uh, nematode-resistant varieties coming that I don't even have information on. But I'm excited about the opportunity and what's happening with them. Okay, so what I title this is Opportunities for 2015. What are the investments? Everything I do, everything the county agents who I work with do has got to be got to make a return on the investment for the growers. Okay? We talk about the cotton, we talk about the disease, talk about the nematodes. As a plant pathologist, I'm interested just because, just to look at what happens with the diseases, just what happens with the nematodes. But for the growers, <coughs> unless it makes you money, it really doesn't matter. Okay? So here's the ways in my world in cotton how growers can spend their money, how they can invest their money, and hopefully come up with making more money at the end of the season. We'll talk about nematode-resistant varieties. As far as I'm concerned, that's one of the single most exciting developments in my world as far as cotton disease and nematode management is the opportunity for varieties that have resistance and perform well even when we got nematode populations. And we're going to talk about what those populations are. We're also going to talk about the fact that the nematode-resistant varieties are changing. The big change is we've gone from a single gene for resistance to now two genes for resistance. That's important. The second thing is that in the past, when you looked at an nematode resistant variety in your mind, you said, yeah, I would like it, but it's also going to cost me yield potential. I think as we move forward, these next varieties, it's going to be less and less of a concern, yield potential, meaning they would yield well whether you planted them with nematodes or didn't. Okay? Seed treatments. You got fungicide seed treatments I won't talk about. A little bit about nematode seed treatments, nematicide seed treatments. Eris, Avicta, Acceleron N. And that's becoming more and more important because what we'll see is since the loss of Timic, we've had Telone, we've had seed treatments and nothing in between. And if a grower wasn't going to use Telone, Adrian, they had to get by with maybe Vidate and a seed treatment. That's changing. We're going to have a middle category now. Also with seed treatments, this with this. If you plant a nematode-resistant variety, does it pay you to use a nematicide seed treatment? If that's the answer you're wanting, I'll tell you we're still working on it. 
Okay? Well, we have some indications. We'll talk about leaf spot diseases, specifically target spot. Last year wasn't a big year for target spot. We've got a new fungicide on the horizon that may help us to make a better decisions on how we're going to manage it. <clears throat> and then the management of nematodes, we've got Telone 2, Jared, Counter 20G. Counter 20G is a long-time insecticide nematicide for management of thrips, for management of nematodes on corn. Okay? Now we had it legally, and I say legally because up until last year we were still probably using it on cotton off-label. We had a Section 18 last year. Today, when I'm not in here, I'm supposed to be writing a letter requesting a Section 18 along with South Carolina, North Carolina, and Texas to see if the EPA will grant one more year. The EPA, what class of chemistry is counter? It's an OP. What's an OP? Organophosphate. And I think on the walls in the EPA, they say we hate organophosphates. All right? They do not want them. So we're going to see. And then we're going to talk about volume total. As an aside, an investment. This book came out in 2014, December of 2014. And it's actually a quite popular book right now, probably for the next month. All right? So if you have an interest in cotton, the worldwide history of cotton, you can get it on Amazon for less than $20, I think. But it's called The Empire of Cotton. Steve, it's actually a pretty good book, so you may want to consider it. Okay? Last year <clears throat> can be summed up in four words. Wet, early, dry, later. Okay? How did the wet weather early in the season affect us in my world is what we do. Wet weather early in the season did what? Delayed planting. Increase the risk of seedling diseases. Why? If we slow the emergence down of the cotton, if we have the free moisture, if we have too much moisture, can be affect seedling diseases. Okay? The other thing it can do, and Jared can tell you, is what's the big thing it did in your world, Jared? It made growers not able to get the telone out. It's hard to put out a fumigant like telone if you can't get in the field or if you're going to be delayed. So the big story early was that early wet increased the likelihood of seedling disease and made it harder to put out some of our nematicide seed treatments, I mean, nematicide treatments like telling. Later as it got warm, what's the drought do? What's the hot weather do? The first thing it did, whatever stock you put in target spot or don't, last year, for many growers, Mark, I don't know about your situation, but for many growers where you had dry conditions, target spot wasn't as bad as it's been in previous years. Also, the drought stress complicates nematode damage. So if you take a field where you wish you'd had telone, but you couldn't put it out, and then you have nematodes, and then you have the drought stress and a compromised root system, it just makes it worse. So the weather last year was not conducive as far as managing some of these pests, but did make other ones like bull rots. Bull rot was minimal last year for a lot of growers. So was um, leaf spot diseases. I talk a little bit about target spot, which we call coroness for leaf spot. Okay. Target spot's not the only disease of leaves out there. It's not the only one. And a year like 2014, which started out wet, before it got dry, diseases like wet weather blight, ascochyta wet weather blight, occur. They're incidental. Okay? What I talk to the agents about, and the consultants already know, is that wet weather blight, like its name says, if it's excessively wet, comes in and usually, once it dries off, once the season goes along, it goes away. It's become more important now because the lesions can look a lot like target spot. And before we overreact, before we say we got target spot, before we say we need to do something, we need to be able to recognize what weather blight. Okay? Simply because we don't want to misidentify it and think we're behind the curve. The other one is, and if you've heard me talk before on cotton foliar disease, the stempelium leaf spot. What's the underlying cause of stempelium leaf spot? Okay. Scott, how many times have we seen it been over with you? Right? Potassium deficiencies. Why was last year in some areas particularly bad for stemphilium leaf spot? Early it was wet, but, and that may affect your potassium, may affect your fertilizer, right, if you got some leaching. And then when it turns dry, it may be difficult to take what remains of the potassium up in the plant. So if you got lower potassium rates or not able to get in the plant because of it moves in the water stream, then you run into potassium deficiency and symphilium leaf spot. Okay? These foliar diseases, and I talk a lot about target spot, 
what we know and what we don't know. But really, the first disease that we saw where you could use a fungicide, here's headline, here's no headline. This is in Aplin County back in 2007 with areolate mildew. Okay? Areolate mildew is incidental. Sometimes it happens, especially in fields in the Atkinson County, Aplin County, some of the eastern flatwood soil fields for some reason. I had a talk today, someone was talking to me about it being a real problem last year in Dodge County. Okay? It can show up, it's incidental. But you can see the difference between a fungicide and no fungicide. Point being that some will argue, some will argue, and effectively, that loss of some leaves, especially later in the season, is not a bad thing. Premature defoliation is not a bad thing in some situations. Why? You open the canopy up. One of the biggest problems we have in cotton is bowl rot. One of the reasons why bowl rot is such a problem is we don't effectively have a fungicide program to get the fungicide down to where the bowls are. So if we can open the canopy up, reduce the humidity, that's a good thing. Okay? But the question is, why am I concerned about a disease like target spot? Why might areolate mildew be a bad thing? And what's the value of the cotton leaves in the first place? Okay? Absolutely, we know the leaves are critical for growth and development. There's no doubt. Why? The leaves are where the chloroplasts are. The chloroplasts are what make the sugars. The sugars are what feeds the plant. That's first grade stuff, right? The second thing is, when the developing bowl, as the bowl develops, the subtending leaf, the leaf that is directly adjacent to that bowl, is important in the nutrition for that bowl. Okay? If that leaf is compromised, if that leaf is lost, it doesn't mean the bowl is lost, but it does increase the likelihood that that bowl will be shed. If you lose the subtending leaf, bowl shed can occur, but if nothing else, the plant has to scramble, if you will, to find another way to feed the bowl. And it does that, okay? But the subtending leaf is important. Leaves that are younger than 23 days, approximately. Russ Nody was in here one time from Phytogen, and he's a cotton physiologist. And he looked and he said, I don't know that your numbers are correct. But you get the gist of it. Okay? Young leaves, they are developing the photosynthase, the sugars they produce, feed that leaf. They feed themselves first. Between some period of time when they're middle-aged leaves, that's when those leaves are photosynthetically active and producing more sugars than they need. And those sugars are shared with the plant itself and with the bowl. Once they become older leaves, they actually require nutrients. They're taking more to keep them on the plant than they make themselves. Or leaves that are deep in the canopy with not getting much, or much sunlight for photosynthesis. They're actually taking more photosynthates and sugars than they're producing. Okay? If we want to continue to keep the crop growing, if we want the crop to have that top crop, we have to have a continuous supply of young leaves. If we lose those older leaves, who cares? If we lose those older leaves, it may open the canopy up. If we lose leaves that are in the shade and are not photosynthetically active or maximizing, who cares? But once disease reaches a point where we're taking these leaves and affecting these leaves, that's where I believe bowl loss or, uh, yield losses can occur. Stemphilium leaf spot is an example where all the leaves are affected. The potassium deficiency affects all the leaves, okay, and can affect them very quickly. I've seen fields that look good to go from good, you can see in the back, looks good to go something like that, can seemingly occur within a matter of days, probably within two weeks. The plant crashes, and that's a good picture right there, because you can see, why would you have a potassium deficiency, or why would you see some phyllium here and not behind it? Same field, why do you have patches like that? It has to do with the unequal distribution of the nutrient, perhaps, or the different soil types, or anything that's going to affect the nutrient uptake and can happen quickly. When you see leaves affected by stemphilium, they're going to be bronzing. They're going to be yellowing. They're going to show nutrient deficiencies. They're going to be covered with ashen spots indicative of stemphilium. So why is that important? Why is it important to recognize the symptoms of stemphilium leaf spot? Because you're not making a fungicide application. Though some would say you should make a fungicide application, but not me. Okay? I can tell you the reason you need to know this is applying a fungicide is going to do nothing for you. All right? 
The second thing is, if you get to this point right here, I always get the question, well, can we foliar feed potassium? Well, I'm not Glenn Harris, okay? All right? Glenn says, and I believe him, that if you have to catch it, if you're going to catch potassium deficiency and foliar feed successfully to avoid symphilium leaf spot, you have to catch it before you see it. You have to catch it before you see it. If you see it, it's too late. Target spot. Larger lesions, concentric rings, do not show nutrient deficiency for the most part. Older leaves which are falling off and defoliating, they may be yellowing from being aged, but for the most part you don't see the nutrient deficiency. You see the spots, as far as we know, it's not tied to a loss, it's not tied to insufficient potassium, but nitrogen may have effect on it. Nitrogen may be indirectly strongly associated with target spot. Why? Too much or too little nitrogen? Too much. Too much. If for no other reason than Overfertilization can lead to a rank canopy. A rank canopy holds that moisture in. Overfertilization may make the leaves more succulent, more susceptible to infection. Okay? But certainly not tied to a potassium deficiency. What's the difference? Symphilium leaf spot, immediate defoliation, complete defoliation the top with the plant from top to bottom. When you have that defoliation, there's no hope those bowls will open. We need to manage the filling leaf spot. The filling leaf spot in a field, in areas where it's that bad, probably leads to close to 100% yield loss. 100% yield loss in fields severely affected. Okay? In fields affected by target spot, starts in the bottom, requires the leaf wetness period. It never does defoliate the very top because the leaves dry off too quick. What do we estimate the yield losses to be? Maybe 20%. Maybe. So far, we've successfully protected, I believe, about 200 pounds of lint in a field in a severe case. What's the losses in stemphilium? Nearly 100%. And talking about target spot, we have, we're trying to develop a risk index. The most important factor right now is where you are in the state. Location means everything. Standing right here in Tiff County, I would say we're probably at about a 15. More points means higher risk, 15 to 20. If you're where Mark is or where Scott is, you're probably between a 20 and a 25. Okay, that's the southwest corner of the state. The other thing is excessive rank growth. We could almost eliminate target spot, I believe, the better we manage growth, the better we keep that canopy open. And a year like last year with the dry conditions where we had short, dry, uh, short leaf wetness periods, not a problem. Okay? It's in the literature that for this pathogen, the Coronestra fungus, it takes about 16 hours of leaf wetness. If you're walking through the canopy at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and your pants are green and wet, you've got a potential problem. If you're out there at 10 o'clock in the morning and not much stain, not much leaf wetness, you don't have a problem. Right? This is the area where we first identified it, where it was first identified and they brought me along, I should say. Okay? But I can tell you that all across the coastal plain, it's a problem now and a potentially a problem in other states as well. Okay. The problem with last year, or the good thing about last year, is if you look at that red right there, that's that red right there. Okay? So again, weather has a huge impact on target spot. I believe that growers can make money by using fungicides judiciously, using them appropriately on cotton. But it's things like this where you'll never hear me say that a Grower should blindly make an application. Okay? Growers should be prepared to make applications. But when the conditions are not favorable, they don't need to. Who should make an application? Who should be most prepared? High yielding varieties. Okay? Excess growth. Good input management or uh, high input. Had a problem with it in the past. The people most likely to make the appropriate timing are those who have somebody scouting their cotton saying, let's hold off. I'm going to tell you the third week of bloom makes a lot of sense. But a scout can tell you, should we go a little bit earlier, should we go later? Okay. What do we know for sure through glass darkly? We know for sure that disease severity and defoliation is reduced with the application of fungicides. There's no controversy over that. I can reduce the severity of disease using fungicides and reduce defoliation. Okay? 
I can also tell you that yields are variable and not necessarily consistent. Just by using a fungicide at the first and third week of bloom does not guarantee a yield increase and certainly doesn't guarantee that you're going to make money. But when the conditions are right, when the crop is right, when the disease is severe, we do make the yields. Okay? One of the most frustrating things is with target spot, even aggressive fungicide treatments, we cannot stop the disease. If you're familiar with peanuts, peanut leaf spot, we can stop peanut leaf spot diseases with a good fungicide program. We spray seven times. With cotton, we're trying to look at one or two applications. We could never stop the disease, peanut leaf spot, with one or two applications. We're trying to do that with cotton. It's frustrating. Our recommendations now are looking for best timing, best fungicides, resistance, and best recommendations. The fungicides we have available. What's new? Okay. High preaxial. Last year we had the headline, twin line, and quadris. We have those again this year. Preaxial is anticipated to being labeled in 2015. Preaxial, like twin line, like headline, is from BASF. Preaxial is a combination of headline or pyracostrobin, the SDHI class flux of pyraxid. Okay. What do I like about it? What do I like about it? First, from our trials, Preaxor seems to be better than Headline, and Headline's our best fungicide out there now. What I like even more about that is that the fungus that causes target spot is extremely aggressive and prone to resistance. If you spray Quadrus or if you spray Headline, our two best fungicides today, they're the same mode of action, they're the same chemistry, you are selecting for what? You're selecting for resistance. If we switch or alternate a product like Preaxor, Preaxor has two modes of action will reduce the chance of resistance. Somebody said, what's it going to cost? I don't know. I'm not sure. But hopefully it's not going to be that much more than Headline because Headline is a very strong fungicide as well. If you grow peanuts, the ASF is going to move towards Preaxor and peanuts. If you grow corn, if you grow cotton, if you go soybeans, preaxial is going to be the material they're looking at in place of headline. Okay. Any questions on that? Target spot and fungicides. Okay. First trial we've got, we threw a lot of different fungicides at it. You can't read it, but a lot of different modes of action looking to see if other fungicides beyond that headline and that quadrus had efficacy. To be honest with you, there were two companies, BASF and Syngenta, who have been there from the beginning as far as the opportunity for fungicides because a lot of other companies didn't believe there was anything there. Okay? Now companies are wanting to make sure they got some product, so companies like Bayer and DuPont are more involved now. Okay? We got three classes, the strobilurins, headline, and quadrants. What's the red flag? Very susceptible to resistance, and we're spraying those fungicides. I don't think they're going to be a problem. We've got the triazole fungicides. Tebuconazole is labeled on cotton, but we don't talk about it. Why? Because I don't want to save you money? No. It's cheap. So what? It doesn't work at all. Okay? Then you've got the SDHI carboximins. A lot of information. Set it up as we've got three or two sprays, first and third week of bloom. And there you got ratings on the 15th of September, the 30th of September, and the 17th of October. And here's your treatments. The ones that are circled are the ones that look the best. This is an SDHI chemistry plus a triazole. Here's headline plus quadrus. You can see that most fungicides led to a reduction early in the season when yellow, but by the time you get to that second rating in blue, it's only a couple of the chemistries, perhaps the provost or the propulse that throughout the season Hang on to give you a reduction. The reduction in severity here versus in your treated check is primarily consistent with the headline and quadrus. Okay. Now, if it was a perfect story, which target spot never is, we'd see the yields respond. Okay. All we can say is, once again, not significant. At the 95%, 95 times out of 100, I can't tell you. That's our standard. 95 times out of 100, I can't tell you we're going to make money or make yield by spraying. Okay? But what I can tell you, there's your seed cotton. The difference between that and this and this and this is approximately 175 pounds in length. 
And the magic number, Scott, that we see over and over again with great variability and great frustration is that number. It's consistent around that number. Okay? Second trial, this is with DuPont and Adipolgus. Again, looking at defoliation, only spray the, the uh, sorry, we got the first and third week of bloom, the third week of bloom, Fontellus, Thapgard, again, the best performers are one first and third week of bloom, third week of bloom, as far as headline goes. Okay? Our best product out there. But again, when we look at yields, it works really well. We got headline at the third week of bloom. We made that 160 pounds of lint, or whatever it is, but frustrated because this neighbor didn't. Okay? Very frustrating. Looking at varieties. This isn't a single variety problem. We looked at 1252, 1454, 1740, 4946, 499, 427, 367. The blue is the level of defoliation where we sprayed. The red is where we didn't spray. 367, 1454 had significant increases in defoliation where we didn't spray. The others were close, but certainly had an increase in defoliation. It's not a one variety problem. It's where you are and what the canopy growth looks like. And when we look at yields in every situation, every situation we saw a we saw an increase in yield with a fungicide application. But it was 367, 1740, and 1252, which met that 90 or 95, met the 95% confidence interval. Okay? So we see it's not a one variety problem. So what were we saying? Target spot. Auburn and Georgia are on about the same sheet, or same page with recommendations. Your risk increases in the area you are and the kind of cotton, the rank growth you have. If we were to pick, Mark, one single best timing without scouting is probably the third week of bloom. The most consistent results are the first and third week of bloom. But the first and third may be too many, and the third may not be the right time, the best time. That's where a scout comes in or somebody looking at the field. Okay? I have no doubt that where target spot's a problem, protecting it with fungicides matters, but we need to do it carefully. Should a grower automatically spray? If you've got rank growth, if you've got good yield potential, if you've had the favorable environmental conditions, if you've had the problem before, yes, I would be prepared to make a spray and maybe adjust the date a little bit. But if conditions are unfavorable, then you hold off until you know what you've got. Any questions on the target spot? Any questions? Okay. Plant parasitic nematodes. For all the target spot is or isn't, plant parasitic nematodes are certainly more widespread and the potential damage can be devastating. Okay. This is an updated map now, but this is the distribution of the southern root knot nematode in Georgia. Red means there's a lot of them. Orange means there's a moderate amount. Yellow means it's there. <coughs> Green would mean we probably didn't find it, but we know it's there. Okay? The southern root knot nematode is found in at least 70% of our fields, and in this area, even more than that. The southern root knot nematode is the most widespread damaging nematode affecting cotton in Georgia. Okay? Severe losses in many fields, and with the loss of Timic, with the loss of Autocarb, we've had to take on an integrated approach to how we're going to manage it. Okay. There is a University of Georgia farm west of Camilla, Georgia, called the Stripling. Oh, hey, Calvin, I didn't see you walk in there. Stripling Irrigation Park. And I thought early on that Stripling Irrigation Park was the one field in the state of Georgia that didn't have nematodes because I couldn't find them, but now, Calvin, you've made my day because they're covered up with them. In fact, they've had to change some of their production practices. They even like telone out there now, Jared. How about that? All right? The take-home lesson is no matter where you grow a crop in Georgia, if you're growing cotton, if you're growing soybeans, if you're growing corn, vegetables, the southern root knot nematodes will find you. They will find you. So with the loss of Temic, we're looking now at varieties, we're looking at the use of Telone, we're looking at seed treatment nematicides like Eris, Evicta, Acceleron N, Vidate, and now we've got two other materials to talk about. The symptoms. 
This is not herbicide injury. Though Stanley gets these calls. This is a nutritional deficiency. But it's not because of insufficient nutrients. It's because the root system is compromised. Okay? If you see symptoms like this, and you go out and carefully dig up the roots and there are no knots or galls on it, does that, what's that mean? If you see symptoms like this, and you go out and dig up the roots and there's no rotten, no galls on them, what's it mean? What's it mean? It means it's not root knot. It doesn't mean it's not nematodes, right? Could be reniform. This is from South Georgia as well. This is from Grady County. There were no galls on the roots, and so the county aid, no, that's not Grady County, I'm sorry. This was uh, Thomas County. Thomas County. There were, no root, there were no galls in the roots, so it had to be herbicide, right? The population came back reniform. Okay. Got to check and see what the nematode populations are. Something else I want you to look for, growers need to be aware of, is fusarium wilt. Fusarium wilt oftentimes comes in association with nematodes. The nematodes create the damage, the fusarium pathogen gets in, not only does it stunt the plant, but it kills the plant. If you take the stalk and you split it open, you'll see a brown discoloration. There's a problem with fusarium wilt. The problem is once it gets into a field, it can be devastating, and there's really nothing we can do except for try to rotate away from it okay? and try and manage the nematodes. Okay. Depending upon where you are in the state, yellow is root knot nematode, the orange is reniform, blue is sting, and the red is lance nematodes. If you're in Pierce County over in southeast Georgia, it's almost 100% of our fields that were infested, were infested with southern root knot nematodes. In Jefferson County, you've got equal proportions, reniform, lance, and, and uh, root knot. Why? Why would you have a different proportion of nematodes in different areas of the state? Soil type. Absolutely. Plant parasitic nematodes are actually aquatic. They're actually aquatic animals. And they survive in that thin film of moisture that surrounds the soil particles. That's why if it's very dry, they're moving down in the soil profile. If it's wet, they're moving up. So, some nematodes like the sting, like the Columbia lance, and the root knot nematode like very sandy soils. The reniform nematode can survive over a range of soils. And that's why when you look, sandy soils in Pierce County, you're going to have a high population of root knot, Multiple soil types in Jefferson County, you're going to have variation. It makes a difference. And why do I talk about this? Is, this is baby stuff, right? This is baby stuff. The uh, economic threshold levels. I've been talking about this since 2002, okay? Threshold level is a number at which we believe if you have more than 100 southern root knot nematodes in a fall sample in a soil you take, we believe that the damage they're causing justifies investing in a nematicide. If you have more than 250 reniform, we believe that the damage they cause next year justifies a nematicide. Why do we talk about that now? Why do I talk about soil types? Why do I talk about the different performance, the economic threshold? Why today? These slides you've seen before. Why? Next year, exactly right, but now we've got different options. Now I talk about it because if we're going to think about planting Steve 427 from Phytogen or 1454 from DPL, we need to know, are we dealing with Jefferson County, where it could be any of these nematodes, or Pierce County? The first reason we talk about these nematode types now is because we have to know when we make our management decisions. The second reason we talk about it is we've got some new nematicides on the way. We've got vellum total. We had counter last year, we may have it this year. Whether you've got 100 root knot nematodes or 600 root knot nematodes make a difference in whether you're going to go with a C treatment or you're going to use tell -all. We've got a variety of treatments out there now, and knowing what our nematode counts are is even more critical. Because if we come back with 50 root knot nematodes, I still might put a C treatment out there. But if I come back with 300, I'm certainly going to rely upon something in addition to a seed treatment. Okay? If it comes back with reniform nematode, I'm not going to reply, rely upon 49-46 from Stone. Okay? What are the varieties? 
something really exciting has happened since we start, first started getting these nematode-resistant varieties. And one of the first ones was 367. And 367 looks good. But 367 has a single gene for resistance. Vitagen 427 has two genes for resistance. And two is better than one. What are those two genes doing? Well, I don't know, but they're helping. Okay? I can't tell you exactly what they do. I got a good feeling for what the first gene does. The female gets into the root, and she wants to create that gall, and the plant doesn't respond, it doesn't recognize her, and it doesn't produce that gall. The root is not damaged like it would be. What's the second gene do? We're still not sure. It may inhibit her getting into the root in the first place. So two genes are fighting in 427 and 1454. Okay? But we have other varieties like 49 and 46, which are very popular now. Take-home point. These varieties have resistance to the root knot nematode, southern root knot nematode. Reniform, sting, or lance, they're going to walk right through that resistance or crawl or wiggle, whatever they do. Okay? The second thing is that this resistance, as we'll see, does not guarantee yield. The biggest question I get, the biggest question I get when considering nematodes and varieties is, am I better off planting a resistant variety that has a slight or a reduction in yield potential, or am I better taking a high-yielding variety and stacking the nematocytes with it? And the answer is, it depends. If I've got a field with moderate nematode populations or low nematode populations, for the most part, I'm going to bank on the highest yielding variety and protecting it with a nematocyte. But as the number of root knot nematodes grows greater and greater and greater, the value in these root knot nematode resistant varieties becomes greater and greater and greater. Okay? I've got these blocked out. The first block is 427, four, they're all 427, which is nematode resistant, 499, which is not, 367, which is, and 370 high, which is not. It's repped here. This is telone plus Evicta, telone plus Cruiser. This is our most aggressive treatment. Telone's aggressive. This is just Evicta, and this is untreated. It's just got Cruiser. Okay? What I want you to notice is the Christmas colors, red and green, Red and green Christmas colors is 427 and 367. And this is the damage at the end of the season. This is how badly they're galled. The Florida Gator colors, orange and blue, are the Auburn colors, Mark. We'll call it Auburn colors because I think that's, people like Auburn better than like my Gators. Okay? The Auburn colors are susceptible varieties. And what you see as you go across the red and green the red and green, the actual damage doesn't change very much depending upon whether you're using Telone or the Evicta or the Cruiser in this trial. It did not change much. That's your resistance. That's number one. Number two is in the Christmas colors, red and green, red is always shorter than green. 427 is more resistant with two genes than 367 is with one gene. And the last thing is that when you look at the seed treatments, even the telone, you can still have end of season damage associated with those susceptible varieties. When you look at the nematode counts, again, 427 and 367 are Christmas, 499 and 375 are Auburn. Resistant versus susceptible. This is the, what the nematodes that are left in the field. And what you will see is, especially in a situation like that, planting 427 was like planting what? The final nematode populations compared to, well, here we're at, with 499, we're at 375 root knot nematodes. We're 3.75 times our threshold. We are down around 5 with 427. Planting 427 in that field was equivalent to what? Planting a non-host crop. The value in planting these varieties is not only in the yield that you get, it is in that you reduce the nematode populations they build up so slightly that it's like you didn't plant cotton in there at all. If you come in next year with cotton following this, you're going to have a very low nematode population. Okay. Also, again, the Christmas colors, the green is always a reduction, but the red is even more, two genes. What's the value? The value is in less damage, and in 
lower population buildup. Craig Perriman, you ever been there before, Scott? Time or two. Okay. Okay. We had a trial out there with the county agent this year. Here's the varieties that were planted. And red are the ones that had resistance, and black are the ones that didn't. The whole hypothesis in this trial, the objective of this study was, what if we take telone and treat each of these varieties with and without telone and see what happens? Because if in a perfect world what would happen is, if we put telone under 499, we would see a great yield response. <coughs> if we put telone under 427, we wouldn't see any response. In a perfect world, we'd be looking at protecting the resistant varieties and not see any benefit from telone. The soil fumigant, a susceptible variety would be what we would. Okay. 367, or 499, 367, 427. This is the final root knot nematode counts. Red is where we used telone, blue is where we didn't. Red is where we used telone, blue is where we didn't. Well, one thing that works, susceptible variety, resistant variety, more resistant variety. As you get greater resistance, again, you reduce the nematode populations. But it's upside down. If you look at 1740, if you look at 49, 46, 375, 499, we got more nematodes where we used telone than where we didn't. The first thing you're thinking is Bob once again did the trial wrong, right? Okay? But I did it right. Or actually Craig did it right. I know he wouldn't screw it up. So how do we explain that? This is not that unusual. It's not that unusual to find more nematodes at the end of the season we're telling one out. Why is that? Because you've got a more robust root system and expanded root system. If you protected the root system, you may have a nematode buildup. That's not what we, this is what we expect. The second thing though, again, no genes, one gene, two genes. When we look at plant height, yes, Steve. Great question. Let's do it right now. Okay. Okay. It is low. All right. It is low. So if the further than that question answers a lot when we get to yield. What's the economic threshold for end of season fall counts on root knot nematode? One hundred. And there were some individual plots, but when you overall, they were all low. Why? Okay. The rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say, is that he had peanuts in here the year before. And by rotating peanuts in, that's the first time, son of a gun, he's ever put peanuts in there in my experience. All right? But a year of peanuts brought those nematode populations down. What does that matter? That seems unusual, too, that it's back to back. How many years did it Did it knock it down that much, or is that special? All I can say is, is I've been in that field many times, and the nematode levels are usually up around four or 500. Now, what it could have also been is a combination of dry weather and rotation. Dry weather could have had an impact as well. But it was irrigated now. We've got irrigation that way. But the point would be in this trial, would, if the grower had known this and we weren't doing a trial here, would you have ever put telone out where you got 90 root knot nematodes? You would not. Okay? So it's a little bit artificial in that sense. But the reason, and primarily I believe is rotation, the peanuts may have been something else as well, but the nematode populations were down. That being said, here's the plant height at 28 days after planting. Red is where we use telone, blue is where we didn't. Okay? And even varieties like 49, 46, 427, and 1454, the varieties with the most resistance, they all show a growth response. So clearly, using a nematicide or a nematicide like telone resulted in positive growth, even though they have good resistance. And when you can see that here, here's 4946 with telone, side by side 4946 without telone. It's a resistant variety. Do these varieties respond to a nematicide like telone? They do. Another question is, do these varieties respond to a, a nematicide like a Victor or Eris, which has a much smaller control level? That's what we're trying to find out. Okay. Root galling at harvest. 1740, we could still see at the end of the season, reduction with telone, 499 reduction with telone. The other ones we saw, basically, the resistance was more important than the telone, but the these varieties, we would expect that. Last thing is yield, okay? Red bar is where telone went out. 
The blue bar is without telomer. And what's interesting, and again, Steve, I'm glad you asked that, because the yield potential here, if we had higher populations, we would expect greater red bars. Okay? But what we do see, even in a population of 90, even with resistant varieties, we're seeing a yield response to using telone on susceptible varieties. Okay? Now, as we went from 90 to 450, 500, where we usually saw the nematode populations to be, what would we expect? We would expect 49, 46, 427, 367, and 1454 to increase their yield potential and a reduction in yield potential without telone on the susceptible varieties. Okay? But the one thing we can say for sure is that even resistant varieties, even resistant varieties can show some benefit in a product like Tello. Okay? So what would our recommendations be in using a resistant variety? The first thing is a resistant variety will have less damage. A resistant variety, especially one like 427, is going to be in some ways like planting a non-host crop. Your nematode populations are going to be low when you go in the following season. If you plant 427 in a root knot nematode field, when you go in the next season, it's going to be almost as if you didn't plant cotton in there in the first place, as far as nematode populations go. Do cotton varieties with resistance, do they respond to nematicides? Absolutely, they respond to a variety or a nematicide like telone. Okay? That's probably going to be the biggest extreme. When it comes to a seed treatment, probably less response. Okay? Questions on that? I got five minutes left. Life after tenic. This is important. Okay? We've talked about telone. We know what the potential for telone is. In a nematode situation, we expect to see three, four, five hundred pounds of lint in a bad situation. You can see from an airplane, you can see where telone is put out in a tough situation. More and more, we're moving towards something we call site specific application. We know that soil types vary within a field. If we can map where those soil types are, the sandier areas, lighter areas in pink or white, heavier areas in dark red, and treat accordingly, it's a profitable way. It's a profitable way to use telone more effectively. Okay. Can it be done? Adrian, we do it in Mitchell County. Scott, we do it in Colquitt County. In fact, Colquitt County growers have not waited for recommendations. They're doing it anyway. In my experience, I've never had a grower who has somebody working with them. I've never had a grower complain about the results from site specific. They're happy with the reduction in cost. They want to use the telone. Since we've lost Timic, we've had a void there. Seed treatments plus Vidate or telone and nothing in between. We got a new fungicide, a new nematicide coming out. Should be labeled in February. It's called Vellum Total. Vellum total is a combination of fluopyram and imidacloprid, the imidacloprid for thrips control. Philip is our entomologist. Philip and I have talked about this. It's the opportunity for both nematode control and for thrips control as you go through. Okay? Cotton and peanuts in 2015, the growers in the country who have access to Vellum total will be growers in Georgia. A few in Alabama a few in Florida. Why are they targeting these growers? Why is Georgia being targeted for this crops? They specifically chose peanuts and cotton. Why? Number one, these growers have a problem with nematodes. Number two, the growers in Georgia never abandoned Timic to go to a seed treatment nematicide. So they feel, Bear Crop Science feels, that they're the growers most likely to return to a product other than a seed treatment. And the last thing is, the application for this is going to be an in spray. It's a liquid in -furrow. A combination of fluopyram and imidacloprid makes vellum total. The growers in the country most likely set up to do that would be peanut growers putting out inoculant and growers who are not adverse putting out in sprays. It's not that bear crop science loves growers in Georgia more than others. It's that these growers are most likely to adopt the technology. If we were talking peanuts, which we're not, I could look you in the eye and I could say, I believe that Vellum Total has performed as well or better than 10 pounds of Timic in furrow, and I've seen it and I believe it. Okay, we're talking cotton. My cotton trials have been less conclusive because of the fields I'm working in. 
But if you talk to grower, talk to my counterparts around the cotton belt, without exception, they believe that Vellum Total is going to be a strong product somewhere between telone and seed treatments. Greater activity than seed treatments for sure, certainly not a telone application. Okay. This is the number of nematode galls per root system four weeks after planting. What we want to try and do is have as few nematodes early in the season affecting the crop. We can't protect it all year long, but we want to have as few as we can. Here's the gaucho alone. These are nematode counts, 11.8 with Temic. 10 ounces of, of, of vellum was 11, 18 ounces 11, and for whatever reason, 20 with 14. That's how you know I didn't make the data up. It's not always perfect, all right? But what you can see is the vellum total is protecting that root <coughs> system. When you look at yields, again, seed cotton yield, what I can say is, and this is not the right F for that value for this, here is the 14 ounces, the 18 ounces, the 10 ounces, there's the Temic. The data I have is comparable to five pounds of Temic going in furrow. From around the belt, it's looking pretty good as well. Talk to Philip. My rate's typically around 14 ounces. Philip, you say the more imidacloprid you can get out, the better as far as thrips control. Is that right? Okay. The rate range is 14 to 18 ounces. What to remember? In furrow, thrips and nematode management. It doesn't matter if it's root knot, reniform, lance, or sting. Okay, it can be put out. Last slide. Last year we had that section 18 for counter. I would like to say that last year was the first year that any cotton grower in the state of Georgia has ever put counter underneath their cotton. Because it's never been labeled before. Okay, we know that's probably not the case. What are my feelings on counter? We may have a section 18 this year. The EPA does not want to give it, but we may have it. My experience with counter is we don't have a whole lot of positive yield data on it. Okay? Growers want to use it. Counter is not the same as Temic. The data showing yield response to counter under cotton is sparse. It is an insecticide. It is an amatocide. Any comments as far as the thrips control, Philip? As good or better than a seed treatment. As good or better than a seed treatment. That sounds like a politically correct answer. Okay. Our data has shown that in a trial in Mitchell County last year with a cotton grower, combination of counter plus a seed treatment was no better than the seed treatment by itself. Okay. In Alabama, my colleagues there swore by counter this year, but their rate they were using was 10 pounds. What do we use? Five to six pounds. Okay. This is not to discourage, but the reality of counter is it is an insecticide and maticide. It will or it won't be Section 18, but this will certainly be the last year if they do it. And the data is variable for cotton. On corn, Adrian, it's much more consistent. On cotton, it's less consistent. 